Hey, everybody, and welcome all to episode 77 of the Self-Publishing Roundtable, the podcast for indie authors by indie authors, where we discuss today's topics and issues that matter to the business of the self-published author. I am your moderator, Wade Finnegan, and my co-panelists, as always, are Michelle Reed. Hello. And Xavier Granville. Hello, Internet. <laughs> we have two special panelists for this episode. Uh, author extraordinaire Nicholas Sansbury smith joins us again. Um, and he tagged along or brought along or is kicking and screaming, I guess, his editor, Aaron Sykes. So um, we're going to let uh, Nick uh, introduce Aaron in a few moments. But uh, first off, for those of you know, if you happen to miss, he was uh, Nick was on our uh, show back on episode 51 almost about a year ago or so, or somewhere around there. So um, he's the author of several hugely successful post-apocalyptic books and short stories. Um, and his transformation of full-time author is a great story, and we'll let him catch you up with that. Um, before that, he used to work for the state of Iowa, and I forgot to ask him last time what he used to do, so i got to find that out. Um, and then uh, he's just... Uh, Kind of hitting it, and he, he, what released a book two days ago, Nick? Right? So uh, yeah, had a couple. Sorry. Yeah, a couple days ago. So, uh, and he also races in triathlons all around the Midwest, which makes me even more envious of him because he's in really fantastic shape. So, <laughs> thanks, Nick, for coming on the show. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, everyone watching us live on selfpublishingroundtable.com, please leave some questions and comments uh, for both these gentlemen, and we'll get our uh, best efforts to get them into the conversation. Um, and also at the end, please take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes or share or give us a thumbs up on YouTube. Uh, all your social media support helps this show stay viable. Um, before we get to Nick, uh, Xavier, I think you have a little uh, announcement you wanted to make. Oh, yeah. Um, so a, a lot of uh, people in the indie uh, community are familiar with uh, Jason Whitehead, the uh, editor. Um, he's done a lot of work for, some people know, for the self-publishing podcast crew, uh, Johnny B. Truant, Sean Platt, and David Wright. And he's done a lot of work for uh, Mikey Campling, uh, myself. He, he, he edited uh, my, my book, Dinosaur Noir. Um, and recently, his father has suffered a stroke, so I just wanted to, you know, put the word out there, you know, just uh, for some support. You know, this guy's done a lot for the indie community, so I just wanted to get the message out there. You know, if if anyone who knows him uh, is feels like just, you know, messaging him, you know, I, I I've been talking to him every now and then. Just make sure he's hanging in there, okay? So, awesome. but uh, yes, we love you. Mwah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, the indie, you, you the indie got, community is very supportive too, which is awesome. Yeah, and and he's done a lot for a lot of uh, great startup indie authors. So, th awesome. thanks a lot, Jason. All right, uh, Nick, uh, why don't you start off by catching us up a little bit? Uh, I think the last time we had you on, Orbs had maybe been out just for a little bit, and it was doing really well. But some really cool things have happened since then. So, why don't you give us a little rundown? Yeah. So. Uh, See, this past uh, 2014 was kind of a crazy year because I was writing two series kind of simultaneously. Um, so Orbs came out in the end of 2013 as a self-published title. Uh, Simon451 picked it up, and uh, they published Orbs 2 uh, in October of 2014, and then two short stories, White Sands and Red Sands. Um, and then Orbs 3 comes out in March of this year, so next month. And uh, meanwhile, I also wrote a uh, book called Extinction Horizon, which Aaron Sykes was the editor on. And um, I might just go ahead and mention, so Aaron, I would not be where I am right now with Extinction Horizon without Aaron. He did a fantastic job, um, both with, like, the military stuff in it um, and the medical stuff. I mean, he has just done a phenomenal job. Uh, so thank you, Aaron. Uh Extinction, he's also edited Extinction Edge, which is the sequel, and it's coming out March 2nd. So, many thanks to you, man. Uh, so, if there's any, if there's any <laughs> indie uh, authors out there that need a really fantastic editor, Aaron's the guy. Um, sounds like he might have some space in his calendar, too, in the near future. So, um, yes. <laughs> so, let's see. Uh, let's, uh, maybe I'll talk about Extinction Horizon a little bit. That is... 
I really didn't have, like, as far as expectations for that novel, I wasn't really sure how it would do. It's uh, actually done better than Orbs so far. Um, the reviews have been fantastic, and um, the ranking has been pretty great, too. So that's been amazing. And, and Extinction Edge actually was... I had finished writing that uh, last year in December, so I put it up for pre-order, um, I think, like, December 28th. And so both of those books were, like, pretty much ready to go. And um, I can talk about the marketing strategy a little bit later, but I think that's um, a really good idea. When, you ha when you're doing a series on Amazon, especially, specifically, um, it's good to have those novels, like, pretty close together, like, three or four months uh, to keep readers invested. Um, so, you, yeah. You mean putting them out in a row like that? Right, right, yeah. And now that uh, Amazon, since my last interview, Amazon has allowed pre-orders, or for indies to put their books up for pre-order, and they allow them to, uh, I think it's like a three-month timetable, so you can put it out three months maximum. Is, mm -hmm. um, and I think I put Extinction Edge out like two months um, after Extinction Horizon. But anyways, uh, we can talk about that more later. But there's definitely been some major developments since Orbs and like the marketing I used. Um, so yeah, that's what I've been doing. I've been working. And then I also have another standalone, which Aaron's read. Um, and it's not really sure. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's actually... Um, it's got, it's, the manuscript's got some issues right now, but it is my favorite book that I've written so far. I probably won't talk too much about that because I'm not sure what the future of it is. Uh, but I wrote that last year, too, um, after I finished Extinction Horizon and kind of while I was writing, finishing up Orbs 3 and then finishing Extinction Edge, if that makes sense. I can't even keep them all track. But, you know, writing full-time, I, I was working... I've been working pretty much 10-hour days for five days a week and then also on the weekends too. So I was writing like a madman possessed last year and I've, I've slowed down this year. So hopefully I'll be able to uh, take a breath from here on out. So j just by design, you, you've you said to slow down. I'm going to pump out for a year. I'm going to just produce, 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 and now I'm going to maybe well, be more sane. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, last year was very stressful as far as writing two series at a time. And the amount of, like, editorial work for the Orbs books was a lot more than I um, anticipated. So, like, when I wasn't writing, I was editing. That was pretty much how I um, scheduled my days. In the morning, I would edit. In the afternoon, I'd write, and vice versa the next day. Kind of, And then when I would get, um, I guess, fed up with one story uh, or frustrated with one story, I would just move on to the other one. And that's, that's another, something that I think is really important for people that are... Um, like writing two series or two books at a time is it's I actually recommend it because oftentimes you're writing a novel and you either get stuck or mm -hmm. something happens and then you can move on to another story so as long as you're organized with like your outlines and your thoughts um, I think it's actually a good strategy to be writing more than one book at a time I have a question go Michelle did, did you edit them at first or did you have been are you saying you edited them yourself before you put no, them out? No, no. Um, so I've at Simon 451, I have a copy editor, kind of like what Aaron does for me. Okay. And then there was a copy editing team that worked on those novels. And then okay. so Aaron has did the copy editing. I'm not sorry, the the content editing for the Extinction series. And then I have a couple other proofreaders that I've hired to to do the copy editing. Okay, very good. Michelle, you have a question <laughs> from Carl. You said. Yeah, uh, do you want to find that, Xavier? It, it scrolled up. Xavier, you, Xavier, you're muted. He is, yes. Oh, he's frozen. Okay, I'll yep. look for it. Yes, um, no, it I, I, got, I got it. Okay, because okay. <laughs> I just found it. So it's, uh, I'll ask the one for Nick first. Uh, why do you think that post-apocalyptic is so hot right now? And uh, what do you think the primary element of a successful post-apocalyptic book is? And then he goes on to ask, what is your perfect Sunday? And what is your favorite book that rhymes with <laughs> Nick's, Nick's Spikel? Uh, all right, so why is oh, post oh, Six Cycle. He's getting that six cycle, sorry. Okay. <laughs> really good book. You got to get a plug in there. Yeah. <laughs> I had to make sure that he that the plug was successful. <laughs> yeah. 
So why is post-apocalyptic so uh, popular right now? I've actually I've had that question like in several interviews, and I and personally I think the reason is because um, of of fear and like the unknown right now. There's so many different stories out there, and we see it in Hollywood, we see it in TV, and um, I think it's because we know what we can lose. Our society could actually lose in an event like that. So like, you know, I'm pretty attached to my electronics. That all goes away. Um, you know, within like two or three weeks of a post-apocalyptic event, food's probably gone, people are starting to riot. I mean, there's just so many different things that can happen, and I think that really terrifies people, and it's fun to read about because it's the what-if question and all these different situations and stories that are out there that put twists on it continue to, um, I think, terrify. And that's why I like reading and writing it is because, I don't know, it makes me take things for granted less. Um, That's a good answer. Yeah, and I, I like what you s said. Uh, uh, what you, what you're getting at with how like what scares people is really relevant relevant to you know it's a product of the time. So if you if you look at what scares people, that's it's really you know what's affecting culture at the time. So if you have all of these, the majority of the populace is glued to the internet and their devices and all this stuff, what would be the thing that scares them most? Probably removing all of those things that, you know, go hand in hand with their daily life. Yeah. Um, I was writing a comment here, but Aaron, do you want to talk about some of the post-apocalyptic post novels that you've edited and uh, kind of why you yeah. think? Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I kind of piggyback on what you were saying there about how it, it really it's very germane to our life right now because of, you know, there's so much connectivity now. We, we can talk to people on the other side of the planet like that, and sure, that sounds kind of banal to mention it, but it's a fact that wasn't a fact 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, and with that connectivity comes a heightened awareness of what's happening. So when you see a picture from you know, the streets in Syria or Jordan or Iraq or Chechnya or Ukraine or, you know, any other place in the world where something's blowing up and people are dying, it becomes that much more immediate. And you can you can extrapolate from that and say, yeah, that, that could be the world. <laughs> if an post-apocalyptic event occurred, that's what we'd be looking at right there. That photograph that's on the front page of the paper, that's my neighborhood. <laughs> um, and so I think the reading of these stories becomes, a friend of mine and I were talking about this yesterday, actually, it becomes a kind of vaccination where you deal with it in a safe environment, you experience mm -hmm. it, you get some enjoyment out of it. There's an adventure story there. There's a there's survival. There's you know grappling with real personal human issues, um, but it also becomes a case of of looking, you know, someone looking into the abyss and seeing what's there and saying, okay, I can deal with that here in this format. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that's a good answer. It's really good answer. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Very good, and and, and that's just, it, it. All comes back to that whole whole thing about just you know empathy and um, just kind of the human experience in the end. Really, you know, if you see violence and you see mm -hmm. destruction, or you witness it through whatever means, whether you're reading it through in the media or you're reading it in a book or you're watching a movie, you know, it's going to have an effect on you. And you know, it's you. It's how you know. Um, it's, that's how storytellers effectively uh, move people and, and get people to read more. It's it's by, you know, taking that human experience and amplifying it through fiction. And the second part of that question was what makes a good post-apocalyptic story, is that correct? Yes, and uh, what's your perfect Sunday? <laughs> oh, okay. okay. So, Aaron, I think you can probably... Uh, hone in on this too because you've read so many of them. I've written several and I read quite a bit, but what do you think makes, you know, a thrilling post-apocalyptic read? Um, well, I mean, if we can, uh, I know you don't want to talk too much about that other manuscript that, that I did a beta read for you on, but um, that one comes to mind right away. And, and the Extinction books too. It's, it's having a novel take on that event. You know, and we live in an age when there are so many stories, there's no such thing as originality anymore. But as long as you can put a spin on your version of the apocalypse that, that feels new and feels exciting and feels adventurous, you've got a good book. And, and all the post-apocalyptic stories that I've edited have had that quality. They've done something that feels unexpected. 
it feels different, it feels, you know, I, I can see where there's um, a synthesis of stories that have come before, but it's done in such a way that it's not just duplication. It's not just copying what those those other authors have done. It's mm -hmm. it's taking two events. Like somebody compared um, the Extinction books to the Hot Zone and World War Z. And I think that's a safe comparison, but it's a lot more than just that. It's a lot more than just taking those two really strong books and, and copying what they did. It's taking the ideas and blending them in a way that gives you this new, fun, adventurous experience. Yeah. And um, I think I can dovetail off that. For the Extinction series, I've always kind of wanted to write a zombie novel, but not a zombie novel. And when I decided to write mm -hmm. Extinction Horizon, which was originally called Hemorrhage, by the way, uh, was talked out of that, I, that the title. Um, yeah, but, that's probably a good idea. Yeah, so, <laughs> anyways, um, I wanted to put a spin on these. So the creatures in Extinction Horizon are not zombies, they're humans, they're very sick humans that are infected with a bioweapon that kind of combines um, Ebola and it has nanostructures nano of a fictitious chemical weapon called VX-99. And so I decided to kind of um, put a, try to put my twist on the genre. And I think that's kind of why it's doing pretty well right now is because it's not only is it a medical thriller, but it's also... Um, it's horror, it's post-apocalyptic, it's science fiction, and it just kind of appeals to a lot of the different um, genres that are out there, and that's what I wanted to do. And so to answer that second part of the question, I would say a successful post-apocalyptic novel puts a really unique spin on, you know, maybe a story that's already been told, but in a different way. So because that's kind of the... I wouldn't say it's a problem, but... I, um, I heard the other day that there's no original story anymore. It, somehow it is derived from another story. And I don't really believe that to be true, but I do think it's harder to come up with an original idea. And I think it's uh, definitely becoming more difficult to stand out in the crowd of, you know, it seems like a lot of, you see new indie authors out there every day writing this, this sort of stuff. So mm -hmm. it's tough. And I, it took me, um, you know, six months of research and actually, I rewrote a lot of Extinction Horizon. It, I, I, the book that um, I thought was ready was an, it ended up being a completely different book almost in the end. Hmm. So sometimes you have to write the wrong thing in order to realize what the right thing is. That's a really good I, point. I've heard yeah. that before. So. <laughs> yep. No, and, uh, and I like what you're saying about the post-apocalyptic genre in, in general. Like When it comes to the whole zombie thing like uh, a lot of readers because of their based on just what whatever they're interested in be it like television with the walking dead or any other zombie based thing um, there is a niche market for just simply a, another zombie book out there so you do have to kind of you know figure out whether whether you are kind of if you're going for just another zombie book or if you are trying to challenge the genre and stick out which really as an author that's I I, I personally think that every author in a way needs needs in a way to put a new spin on something otherwise you're not really creating you're more just kind of churning so uh, and I, I'm gonna add one more thing onto that uh, so with Extinction Horizon, uh, when I first started writing that book, I wanted to be able to answer the question, how scientifically could a human turn into a zombie? And obviously that's, that's impossible. So that's why the creatures in Extinction Horizon are not zombies, but there's something very similar. So I actually explained using um, science, to, uh, and, and I worked with a couple different scientists on this that helped me, um, but I explained how a person could actually um, become something that it's it let me let me backtrack a little bit so I explained how people um, that are infected with this virus what basically why they're trying to eat meat and it's because their metabolism is sped up through um, the infection that's producing more and more stem cells and sign I'm, I'm probably not explain that exactly like it did in the book but that was my goal was to try to explain how that could happen that is so cool that you like went through and because I don't think about my stories quite 
did you like just map it out and were you just emailing people all the time or uh, well when I first came up with the idea I did a lot of research on my own and then um, I started write and I wanted to answer that question so I did want to try to put a twist on it and then I realized I wasn't going to write as like a traditional zombie book these people were going to be alive they weren't going to they're going to be fast moving they're going to have different like traits than normal zombies um, like for example they have these sucker mouths that develop where they actually clamp on and <laughs> yeah I know it's kind of uh, horrifying <laughs> but yeah um, and then I started after the initial research I did then I kind of reached out to um, some people in the scientific field and uh, a biomedical engineer was probably helped me the most well, we don't all know though. So, if, if we wanted to do research, how would we like get into that crowd? Do you just email them up, or what? Um, actually, so the biomedical engineer that I worked with is another author. That and ironically, he contacted me after he saw the show when when I was on it in episode fifty one. Mm -hmm. So, um. And You're actually, welcome. Look at that. I'm, Spurt I'm, making a <laughs> difference. I'm going to pitch his book real quick, okay? Is that yes, cool? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Give me a second. I'll put the link in there. Aaron, did you have anything to add to that while he's looking? Well, I mean, you're asking about you know how to get in touch with experts for, mm -hmm. for doing research as an author. And, and um, I mean, you, you said just email them up. Yeah, you just email them up. Yeah. You know, you think, think about it as a cold call. It's a business cold call. Mm -hmm. So you write a professional email, um, and you send it over to them. If they have an intermediary, you should you know that you should go through. You find that person, and you go through them. Um, you keep it professional. You keep it on the level. You're very honest about what you want, and you know you ask them for for their availability and what they might need in return. If, if some of them, you know, may want named credit. Some of them, I don't know, may want a royalty cut. <laughs> I can't speak to any of that. I've never done it myself. But you should be prepared for them to come back with something. Um, or at the very least, be prepared for them to not get back to you at all. Experts tend to be busy people. So. Right. And <laughs> yeah, then don't cry about it. <laughs> Very good. I think it's yeah. as interesting, though, when you tell people you're writing a book, they seem to be a little more open to it, at least mm -hmm. in my, my brief experience. It's like, well, why do you want to know? Well, I'm writing a book. Oh, and then it's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, versus, versus like you're trying, you know, if you're trying to sell them something or something like that. So they, I, I know I talked to a police officer the other day, and he was like, "Oh, why are you, why are you asking me all these questions?" You know, and then, <laughs> Usually goes the other way, right? Yeah, right. 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 Uh, Xavier, I th think you had a question. We might have got missed there. I can't remember now. I forgot to look at the thing. But did you have another question, Xavier? There was one for Aaron down here. See if I can find it. Uh, well, uh, hold on, I'm reading. <laughs> well, okay, oh. so, okay, you got it. Yes. Uh, what is the most important thing for an author to be aware of? And I think he's saying, as an editor, what should we be thinking about while we're writing it? Um, pacing or dialogue or before we give it to you. Oh, oh. So, what what should an author be thinking of before they send their their manuscript to an editor? Mm -hmm. What should we be most aware of while we're writing this story? Uh, a lot of that, I'm going to say, has to do with your your desire, you know, what you're expecting to get back from the editor. If you know in your mind that your dialogue is weak, then I would, as an author, if I knew my dialogue was weak, I would attend to all the other stuff. I would focus on my pacing. I would focus on my plot beats. I would focus on my characterization as much as possible. I would look out for passive constructions and wonky phrasing. I would I would clean as much junk out of the way so that the editor can concentrate on what I'm, at, what I'm asking them to do. Um, so do you say my dialogue is bad? Can you fix it or what? Um, oh, so yeah, like authors. Uh, well, you know, Nick did this, and other authors have done this. They say, you know, I know that I've got this issue happening, and I, I don't know what to do about it, um, okay. or I'm concerned about, you know, this character feels unfinished to me, or there's this scene here, and I can't figure out how to make it work. Um, you know, if you give me cues like that, then when I hit those parts of the book, I'm paying attention to it, and I'm, you know, I've got your email open next to me or printed out so I can refer to it as I'm working. Um, okay. and I, I do my best to kind of address exactly what you've asked me to do. That is good news because that's what I'm going to email you about later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> good to go. Good to go. Yeah, I think I was anxieties to the side. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm asking for a friend, I promise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no. We always do. <laughs> Xavier, is there another? Um, yeah, no, Carl did have another one. Um, it's for Nick. Um, have you heard or used the Pomodoro writing method? If so, what are your thoughts on it? Never heard of it. Yeah. Neither uh, have I. Colin, Aaron, Colin was big on that. Yeah, yeah. Colin, Colin F. Barnes was big on that a while ago. I'm not sure if he's still doing it, but I remember he talked it up a bit. What is it? Yeah, can you uh, if I, rough, roughly break it down? If I remember right, it was um, it was kind of a you you pace yourself during your writing time. So you give yourself a certain amount of time to write, and then there's a there's a break moment, and then there's you know so you're you're, you're not doing sprints, but you're doing a Oh yeah, I know. I don't know scheduled I blocks. Yeah, and it's you, know, you end up getting yeah. chunks. Yeah, you end up getting so many thousands of words written over the course of a day, mm -hmm. versus if you were just to try and sit down and you know punch keys for hours. <laughs> By forcing yourself to take those breaks, you get a little mental reset. You can you can schedule what you're going to do during each of those breaks and during each of those those writing chunks. So it's like this is scene one. That's it. And after that, that writing chunk is done, then I'm on to my break, and then the next writing chunk is already scheduled for something else, and I can't deviate from this plan. It seemed to help him really, you know, knock stuff out and and, uh, and get it completed without sort of getting bogged down in the details. I think uh, the SPP guys were talking about that the other day, in fact, if I remember right, Sean talking about that. twenty Like, he was doing 25-minute writing sessions, five-minute break, 25-minute yeah, writing session, yeah. five-minute break. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I, I haven't really followed that method. Um, what I try to do is, um, I used to have word counts, um, two to four thousand words a day, but mm -hmm. I would usually, I always break my days up. I, I usually wrote, I write for like two to three hours and then take a break and then come back to it or I switch to editing. That's usually how I do it. Um, and sometimes I'll do like three sessions in a day. I'll do morning, afternoon, and, and night too. So mm -hmm. it's definitely important to pace yourself though and to spread things out because you don't want to sit down for eight hours and try to pump out 5,000 words because when you read back over it, I guarantee you it's not going to be exactly what you thought you put down. <laughs> no. yeah. You might have five <laughs> usable words. Yeah. 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 Um, if nobody's got a question, I want to go. I, I got two questions for Nick, and I know we got to – one, I want to get to some of the marketing stuff. I mean, we're already a half hour in, so it's one of those things because I, I know a lot of our listeners are the one interested about – your new marketing strategies and, and what you've been doing, because that's we talked about that a lot last time, and it sounds like a lot has changed. So we can start with that. And also, I want to at some point just just a little mental reminder to get back to how are you juggling so many so many projects and and what's your day look like and all that stuff as you're as a full time author. So, but first okay. off, let's talk a little bit about marketing. I think. Okay. Um, actually, do you mind if I backtrack just real quick about that book? Um, so Anthony Mel yeah. Melicori is yeah, the author the of... Post. I got it posted in the comments for okay. all those. I just wanted to make sure. You see, he uh, authored the, the God Organ, and he helped out a lot on Extinction Horizon. So um, that's the, that is my pitch for him. Uh, <laughs> so, you want me to talk about marketing first or talk about my day? Sorry. Uh, you you decide. What would you like to okay. go? Go ahead. It's, <laughs> either uh, I think I think most people are probably watching because they want to know what I've done marketing wise. I had someone say today they they said it's magic, but it's not. It's like a lot of authors don't realize the different tools that are out there. I didn't at first. Um, I think my marketing strategy uh, came from you know following authors' blogs that that do that have successful books out there, and then also kind of just you know. Like I put on my stories, I put a twist on my marketing strategy, and I did that again for Extinction Horizon. So let me just – I'll just get into it. I, I'm a big fan of the 99-cent launch strategy, and um, what a lot of authors are doing now uh, is putting their paperbacks up first and sending – just like any publisher, this is completely legit – sending um, ARCs out, advanced review copies, to uh, people on their subscriber list or just fans, and – They'll have you know re readers um, that actually read the book before it comes out on Amazon or if you're putting it on the other sites too. So you can actually start collecting reviews on the book before it launches. That way, you can have a more successful launch on day one and more of the promotional sites that typically only take books that have a certain amount of reviews 
um, they will accept you earlier. So, like, for example, for Extinction Horizon, my goal was to get 20 to 30 reviews before it launched. And I sent it out to about 100 different bloggers, reviewers, fans, and I think it had about 30 reviews on day one, and I had a ton of the promotional sites lined up. And uh, I decided to keep the book at 99 cents for only a week and a half this time, whereas with Orbs I had it at 99 cents for almost a month. And the reason is because when when a book shows up in the rankings on Amazon, the first month is the most important uh, because uh, it shows up in that hot new release category, and that's when it gets the most exposure. So I think if you're going to start messing with your price, it's, it's almost better to put it at you know, two nine nine, three ninety nine, or whatever your price point is, a little bit sooner. Um, but I, I think it's important also to wait until uh, your book starts showing up in the rankings. One and two, uh, it it needs to show up in a lot of different also bots too, because that's exposure in itself. It's basically free marketing Amazon does, in a way, I guess. So if that makes sense. And then there was other things I did too. Um, stop me if. I'm just blabbering, but... Uh, no, no, I, no. Keep going. We're all taking notes. Okay. Yeah. So um, when I said have your paperback ready, that requires a lot of, like, advanced time, you know, planning. And, yeah, a lot. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I also... I've always posted giveaways on my Facebook author page and on Goodreads, and I think that's really important. If you do have a paperback available, put it up on Goodreads. You'll have, like, 100, 200 people shelf your book, and that is more exposure. Um, so I think from now on, with my self-published titles, I'm going to um, have the book, it, for at least for the first in a series, I will have the paperback ready a month or even maybe two months in advance um, and send it out because that's exactly what publishers do. They wait. Um, they send it out to bloggers and readers months in advance, and that's why you see books up for pre-order you know, six months from now sometimes even longer. Yeah, I was so, just thinking the same thing the other day, like precisely that. Are you talking about giving uh, paperback copies away on Goodreads, a Goodreads giveaway? Yeah. Or are you just saying post yeah. it? Yeah, put it, put it up for a giveaway. That way um, people will actually shelf the book. Um, okay. and it then, really works, too. I mean, it worked for me, and I'm nobody, so like, it's not hard to do. You're not nobody. I'm You're not. Michelle Reed. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Anybody can do it. That's all. And uh, let me clarify. When I said that I sent out advanced review copies, most of those were Mobi or EPUB files okay. to bloggers and whatnot. I didn't send out paperbacks. Okay. So that's all would be some, expensive. Yeah, there was only a couple paperbacks I sent out to bloggers that only accept paperbacks. And is that still a good thing to do, is go through and find bloggers? I mean, is that still, like, applicable? Yeah. But that's another thing. I mean, that's just another part of writing. It requires a lot of time. You have to go figure out, you know, who's accepting manuscripts from, or, well, finished novels from indie authors. A lot of bloggers don't do that anymore. And the ones that do are just overwhelmed with requests. So mm -hmm. what I've done is, over the past couple of years, I've kind of just built a list of people that have enjoyed my work or that accept um, books in my genre. And then I... I usually send out about a hundred requests, and you know I might get ten to twenty responses. But it, you know, I really think it's important for books to have reviews right away. Um, a book with one review on Amazon versus ten reviews is there's a huge difference in that. And um, yeah, I guess that's that's, yeah. it, that's pretty much it. I mean, reviews are very important. Yeah, and even two reviews is more important than no reviews. Right. I remember you said last time, and I just want <clears throat> to, sorry, I just want to point this out again. You said that number of reviews is more important than worrying if you have a bunch of five-star reviews. Yeah, and that I think was my it, favorite thing you said. Well, if you look at it this way, um, and I think my editor at Simon451 has kind of helped me because... You know, not all my reviews are great, and especially for Orbs, that was my first book, and it had some problems. But if you look at any book that has had the exposure that bestsellers have, you're bound to get negative reviews no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people. I know. For, yeah, and that's a perfect example. But I know for a fact, like I think as a writer, you have to accept people are not going to like your work, and that's fine. Um, but 
like if you have 600 reviews with like a 4.0 average or something like that, mm -hmm. that's really not that bad. Right. Uh, yeah, so... Um, yeah, that's all that matters. Yeah, I think people often don't even look at necessarily the star rating as how many reviews, because if it has a ton of reviews, that means other people are reading it. Mm -hmm. That was my whole point. I'm done. <laughs> I just love that. I, I listened to your show that we did before three times this week, and I was like, oh, he said it again. <laughs> just keep going. Hey, Xavier, you had, you had some uh, questions you wanted? Yeah. Um, so I, I got one for both of you guys, um, for Nick and for Aaron. Um, so I just wanted to kind of briefly talk on uh, the author-editor relationship um, and just kind of the importance of, you know, how well, you know, it, it does take, you know, an author and an editor working fluidly together on, on a project to, to create a final um, product in the end. So what, uh, Nick, do you look for when you're looking, for, like in, in obviously for Aaron's uh, case for a developmental editor, um, what uh, what do you personally look for when you, you went about choosing uh, Aaron as your developmental editor? and Aaron, uh, what do you look for in a potential indie client, you know, or, or a potential indie manuscript? Yeah, right. Aaron, do you want to start? Go ahead, man. Oh, okay. Um, well, lately it's been, uh, did Darren recommend him <laughs> or her? <laughs> and and you, I mean, it's it, it, you know, maybe I'm, it sounds flippant, but it, the bulk of the business that I've had in the past several months has come through recommendations from one author, Darren Wearmouth. Um, who came to me via Colin, <laughs> and I, I, you know, I've enjoyed working with them on all of the work that we've done together. So I've been able to just take it on faith and trust them that the stuff they're sending our way is going to be work that I'm going to enjoy doing. And it's always worked out. It's always been the case that a manuscript comes across my desk, and whatever you know quality of writing I might be looking at, I can see a story inside of it that I enjoy. And, and that's really all that it takes for me. Um, there have been a couple manuscripts that I've, uh, you know, authors that have come to me through my website, um, not, not through word of mouth. And, I've, you know, I get a sample chapter from them and I look at it and I realize I'm not the editor for this. <laughs> it's either because um, in one case it had been a translated manuscript and I had zero knowledge of the mother tongue. So there's no way that I was qualified to comment on the on a trans on the translation. I'm like I, I can't do this project because, you know, I, I sure I might be able to fix the, the the grammatical problems and the misspellings and whatnot, but the idiomatic stuff, which is really the content of the novel, I can't touch it. <laughs> yeah, you'll be losing um, context. Yeah, so I mean, I, I had to pass on that one. Um, and you know, and another author that came to me again through my website, and I could tell very clearly the person uh, simply was not ready to deliver a manuscript to an editor and I just you know had to be very gentle about it but made that very clear and said this this is a start of an idea of what might someday turn into a story and I was I was more gentle than that <laughs> uh, when I said it um, yeah but ultimately it just comes down to really you know where the where the author comes from and it's been word of mouth since day one with me and it's it's always worked out so yeah, that's a good way to put it uh, Nick, what do you look for in a developmental editor? Uh, well, I think the thing that I was looking for the most when I reached out to Aaron was someone that could help me um, with the military science in my books. Uh, I thought I had knowledge of how the military operates, and in, I think I have relative knowledge, but Aaron's really helped me. I think my dialogue is a lot better now. Well, I mean, I guess I don't... I'll be humble and let you ex say whether that's the case or not. Um, it is. <laughs> but I've definitely learned a lot from him, and that's what I, that's pretty much what I was looking for, and he came highly recommended too. So um, one thing that I did want to talk about this interview was uh, the recommendation of putting a good team together. If you're an indie author, you have to have a good team, and I feel like I have an awesome team together. Now, um, Aaron, obviously, is my content editor, hopefully on future projects as well, including the one that we talked about earlier, and also having, you know, not just necessarily one proofreader or copy editor, but two, 
because, you know, if you can look at a manuscript, Aaron can look at my manuscript, I can look at it a hundred times and we'll still miss stuff. That's why it's important to have, you know, different proofers. And I also have a cover artist now that I'm very happy with too. Um, but it's taken me two years to put together this, this team. And um, it's, I just think it's, it's so important to have good, good editing and a good cover if you're going to self-publish because, you know, first impressions are, you know, you only get one shot at it, really. Uh, that's not to say you can't, like, re-upload your books and whatnot. You know, God, I've put so many different editions out for some of them, <laughs> uh, which is really, the really cool thing about, you know, digital publishing is you can change things. But um, So I'm kind of... Uh, straying away from topic here, but I just wanted to mention that at some point in the interview, and uh, I'm I'm thankful to have Aaron on my team. I like that because you can change something, and you can watch in real time if it's working or not, and then change it as many times as you need to. Uh -huh. That's pretty neat. Um, Carl has another question. Um, Aaron, can you explain your different services? Um, you do copy editing and developmental editing. Do you do anything else? Um. Well, let's start with the developmental editing, uh, which is primarily what I've done with Nick. Um, the you'll, you'll sometimes hear developmental editing called content editing, substantive editing, structural editing. It all refers to, to looking at the manuscript as a work in progress. So the, the author knows that there are inconsistencies, knows that there might be failures of plot, knows that there's a weakness with a character or two. You know, there are issues. The book has issues, and they're getting it to somebody to help them iron all of that out and make it a cohesive whole. Mm -hmm. um, and coherent as well. The, the copy editor, copy editing that I do, uh, is, you know, one step down from that. So while I might now and then make a comment in there where it's like, yeah, it looks like this character is not behaving entirely consistent. Um, primarily with copy editing, it's about uh, fact-checking. Uh, making sure it's clean, making sure the dialogue is consistent. Um, you know, it's, you're going through and doing the nuts and bolts, the mechanics, uh, and there's a bit of proofreading that I do in there as well. If I if I see typos, I fix them. If I see punctuation problems, I fix them. If I see grammar problems, I fix it. Mm -hmm. um, but the the bulk of copy editing for me is to make sure that the manuscript is truthful, so you're not writing in inaccuracies and things that are simply so wildly fantastic that. You know, every reader is going to point at it and go, no, <laughs> right. no, done. Um, yeah, that's the copy editor's job is to avoid that for the author so that, so that you don't have to worry about that review coming in. Okay. And then when you, when they're shopping on your site, like those are for people who are listening and don't know, because I've shopped before mm -hmm. and I know they're different prices, but you have them all listed yeah. out. I do, yeah. And um, and people tell me my rates are too low, and, and the more people that tell me that, the, <laughs> the higher, greater yeah. chances are I'm going to raise them. But for now, they're they're set where they are. Um, and, you know, if, if you go to my website, you'll see, you know, I explain in, in somewhat excruciating detail <laughs> the yeah. difference between a content edit and a copy edit. Um, I remember asking and, Darren Wormouth the difference between them, and I had asked him three different words, and he said, that's all the same thing. Like, you're talking about the same thing. And then he sent me to your site, and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, and, and, and authors, you know, we, we, I'm an author too, and we run into that problem where there are all these terms that get, you know, thrown about, and, well, <laughs> this editor calls it copy editing. This editor over here calls it developmental editing. Right. This editor right. calls it structural editing. And mm -hmm. So, yeah. And we Semantics. think we need to pay for all those things. And yeah. Darren was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, I, I try to do... Um, as much of a whole package as I can, right? I really, I mean, I, I have a background in education and teaching and writing, and I want my my authors to, you know, get something back from me that they can really use to, to move forward. You know, I, I don't want them to have to go through another round of things and another round of things to catch all the little, you know, all the little problems. And I know that's going to happen. I know that, you know, proofreading is, an, is, a, is a stage and, you know, final edits are a stage, but I want to do as much as I possibly can when I get a manuscript, so that so that the author really has you know a, an easy time of it. Um, in the edit letter that I return with manuscripts, I, I detail you know here are the simple fixes, and they're 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 not numbered, but they're they're down there on a list, and usually they'll be presented in a way that you could start at the top and work your way through that list, and you'll you'll have taken care of all the the fiddly bits, the nonsense, mm -hmm. and then below that you're going to have bigger issues. Um, that'll be where you come into inconsistencies of character and plot problems, plot holes, 
uh, structural, you know, problems in that. So. Do they fix those things and then send them back to you again, or how does that work? Yeah, yeah, I do a second pass on everything. Okay. Um, and I, anybody who's shopping for an editor, you should expect a second pass for your money. If you're not getting a second pass for your money, um, you should probably go somewhere else, or you know, maybe the editor's not charging enough, and right. and they're only charging you for a single read. That's that's a, a legitimate thing, but um, really, you should be getting a second a second look at it. Yeah, two two passes at a minimum. Mm -hmm. um, while while we're on the topic of editing, um, Aaron, uh, is there anything uh, that you've noticed within the indie community since since you are getting these uh, books coming in fr from indie authors? Are there any particular flaws that you think need to be addressed? Uh, for people uh, sending uh, out manuscripts, or like any particular things that you are seeing a pattern in within the authors, where it's just like you know that is a no, and you need to fix that. <laughs> um, that's a that's a good question, and I'm not sure I'll answer it as fully as I as I could if I had more time to think about it. But two things come to mind: one, which is very simple, and anybody who writes can do this right now. Open your manuscript and do a search for full stop double space and replace oh. it with full stop single space. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank, you, thank you for that. Yeah, no, I'm, yes. I'm glad you bring that up. It's, it, we no it, longer live in the age of manual typewriters. We uh, have fixed width fonts. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> is not necessary. Of mine. Um, I actually, I have, I have a, um, a tongue-in-cheek award that I put out every time I get a manuscript um, that has no full stops and double spaces in it. I tweet for that author's, uh, you know, do a little signal boost and give them an award, and uh, you know, it's, it's a it's a fun little joke. Yeah, um, that's fantastic. But, but you know, it's it's worth doing. Um, the next the next point to answer your question uh, is a, a little broader. Um, what I've been noticing, and I, I don't claim to have my finger on the pulse of the genre community by any stretch of the imagination. But what I'm seeing in, in tweets and blog posts and articles and, and the general kerfuffle that comes up every now and then is that the genre community is grappling with its identity and how it treats women, people of color, and, and people who, who ever have held a minority position in society. Um, so when you're, when you're dealing with characters in your stories who fit into one of those groups, uh, be careful, <laughs> and be, be thoughtful, and be sensible. Um, don't fall into the trap of automatically assuming every character is white. Don't fall into the trap of assuming every dark-skinned character is bad. Um, you know, and, and this sounds like common sense, and it is, but I still run into it sometimes. And it doesn't mean you can't have a dark-skinned character be a bad person in your story. That's perfectly legit. Um, but be, be cognizant of the fact that the genre community is struggling right now to have an identity that is inclusive and that is tolerant and it is respectful of all people. That is and I think that the more attention we pay to that as writers, the better our stories are going to be and the sooner we will normalize equality and better treatment of everyone. As writers, I think that's kind of one of our jobs. Mm -hmm. So there. Okay, soapbox behind me. I'm done. <laughs> awesome. No, and, awesome. and I think specifically with the genre fiction, um, there are so many talented female authors, specifically in the sci-fi and fantasy community, and there's a lot of them that are starting to show a lot of light nowadays. And you know, I think that's amazing, and we we really do need to start. You know, it's not all, all about these big names that you see uh, for Hugo and Nebula winners and stuff like that. You know, there might be you know one female name that's uh, mi mixed among them, but there are so many good uh, f female genre writers out there, and they're all worth looking into. Good, good point. Um, I wanted uh, Nick to touch on. The full-time aspect of writing a little bit and yeah. and juggling and keeping everything and I like I, I kind of want to know a little bit about your your organizational strategies how you how you're approaching it as a business 
what what your business model looks like and what kind of business plan stuff you do and I know we don't have a ton of time left, so I don't know. Hit whatever points you think are, are really important on that, but I, I was kind of curious on that. Okay. I think the most important thing to say, uh, if you're thinking about full-time writing, is the, the commitment it really is. Because, um, you know, I was lucky going into this. Uh, I had just finished an Ironman triathlon, so I had trained for like, you know, I've been training for a year um, before and after a full-time job and writing at night. So I was ready to make this move and stay motivated um, because that's just kind of the person I, I was and still am. Um, but like I said, I've been working... I, I worked long... I put in long hours last year and I decided to uh, give up most of the triathlon events last year to, pr to kind of pursue this career in writing. And I produced a lot of material. Um, now, I, like I said, I'm going to slow down this year because I think that quality can suffer when you're doing that. And um, at times I did feel like I was riding with a gun to my head. But uh, I tried to be as structured as possible. So, you know, wake up. Um, I usually work at a coffee shop because there's too many distractions at home, um, which is another thing I think a uh, big part of my structure is trying to eliminate as many distractions as possible. So when you're focused on writing, you're focused on writing. Um, so I'll just kind of give a breakdown on like what I do. Uh, like I said earlier, I either write in the morning or I edit in the morning, and then I take a break and do the same thing in the afternoon. But I also squeeze in reading time because I think, you know, a big part of being a writer is also being a reader, and you need to be familiar with what's you know popular out there. Um, and also, I read. Uh, I, I don't just stick to my genre. I try to read. Um, outside of my genre as well. So I think this this afternoon when I finished um, editing, I went and read for an hour and a half. Um, so I think that's a big part of it too. But uh, the other thing is, um, you know, take a day off if you need it. Uh, that was one thing I didn't do a whole lot of last year. I, I've worked pretty much every weekend, you know, for a couple hours on Saturdays and Sundays, but I think I needed to take more time off. So um, I don't know if that if that helps, if that really explains things, but... Um, there was days where, I mean, there was a couple, there was several 12-hour days that I, that I was putting in back to back to back to try to get Extinction Horizon in a format that I was comfortable with. And um, same thing with Extinction Edge. And meanwhile, you know, I was still, I was finishing Warps 3 and this other book. So it really, you have to be organized. And um, I actually had a spreadsheet that I put together that, showed how I allocated my time and to what manuscript. So I knew what I was working on the next day. I, it's just like some people lay their clothes out before work. I always knew what I was working on the next day. So it's, it, it's very important to be organized if you're going to write full time because it's not easy. Um, and there's all sorts of things that you have to worry about. Like I had, I, I worked for emergency management, um, Homeland Security Emergency Management in Iowa before I uh, resigned to do this. And, you know, I had health insurance, dental insurance. I had all of that stuff. Those were worries that I didn't have that um, you will probably, unless, you know, unless your spouse has has those things. But, you know, retirement, all of those things are going to come into play if you're a full-time writer. And so it's... And then the other thing that I'll just close on this is my business plan included reinvesting a lot of the, the profit. Um, I would say about 30% of what I made I reinvested into my books. The covers, the editing, um, the promotion, and I mean even like Facebook ads and just Goodreads ads. I mean everything, the, the 99 cent promotional sites and um, you know editing isn't cheap. A good book cover isn't cheap, but I think it's very important to reinvest your profits and uh, to keep keep uh, your momentum going in that regard. Uh, Did you yeah. uh, purposely like save or set aside a chunk of money when you knew you were going to uh, make the switch to full time? I waited until I signed a contract with Simon and Schuster uh, because I was concerned about self publishing Orbs two and it not doing as well as Orbs 1. So I kind of wanted to wait and see and have at least like a year's worth salary saved up so I could, um, you know, write, not necessarily with a gun to my head like I said I felt like I did, but it, towards the end of last year I did feel that way. I felt like I had to have another series out that was self-published. So I'm making, you know, monthly income and royalties to keep me going um, because 
that's the other thing. The financial strain on writers oftentimes can cause writer's block or other issues that affects your creativity. So it's, it's really important to, I think if you're going to make that jump, either have money saved or a part-time job or something so you don't feel necessarily like if something happens um, and your book doesn't necessarily do as well as you thought it might, uh, that you have some outs. Just like in poker, you always want to leave yourself outs. And that's kind of the mentality I have going into this career. Um, that is a very good point. I like that. Yeah, that mm-hmm. Less like poker. That was a great analogy. Leave mm-hmm. yourself some outs. I played a lot of poker. I still do. So <laughs> that's... <yeah. laughs> Through all the poker analogies every once in a while. <laughs> so ho- hopefully that helps. But, you know, just to kind of reiterate, organization is key, and being keeping yourself motivated is key, too. So however you do that is recommended. Great. Great. Awesome. Uh, all right. So um, actually, I think, Xavier, you, you had mentioned this before, but I'll go ahead and throw out the question. We're kind of getting low on time, but I did want to kind of, for Aaron and Nick both, because um, we do have still a lot of people. It's, it seems weird. It seems like indie publishing is getting older now, but it's still really very uh, it's inf- infant stages. So there's so many people getting started. So what was your best piece of advice either on from the editing side, obviously, from Aaron and from the writing side, from Nick? But what's what's your uh, best piece of advice for someone that wants to to start in, in, in doing this? Aaron, you want to go first? Oh, okay. <laughs> um... <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I think Nick made a, a solid point there. Have have a backup plan. Have an exit strategy. <laughs> um, you know, have some have some financial support there. Uh, once you've got that in place, and, and you know, if, if you've got everything that he just mentioned—the financial support, the organization, the drive and commitment to do it—then just sit down every single day and do it. <laughs> really, um, and build a network around yourself. You know, get on Twitter or Facebook or whatever social media works for you for this and find the other people who are doing the same thing you're doing Um, and network with them, communicate with them. You know, look at Writer Unboxed, uh, follow Jane Friedman and Porter Anderson on Twitter, you know, learn things about the publishing industry and, you know, steep yourself in it. Mm -hmm. And when when you've done that, then taking the next step, which is what Nick has been doing this, this past year, of actually getting yourself out there and publishing your work and, and marketing, um, it'll be a lot easier because you'll have built that, that backlog of knowledge and you'll have built that network behind you to help when you need your signal boosted. That's a good idea. Yeah, helping your signal boost. boost. we got lots of good little analogies going on. I like that. <laughs> That's really good. Uh, did we, I, at least on my end, uh, Nick... Can you hear us? I think he went bye bye. I think he did. I, yeah, I, you, uh, he's frozen. He's like we're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Aaron, least... Aaron, I think you blew his mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll <laughs> yeah, well, so speaking of after parties, uh, since mm-hmm. it is getting uh, to, to the top of the hour, uh, put your name in the in the chat and the email if you don't have a. Uh, Google Plus account or something that we've uh, invited you to, to before, but we'd love to have you guys in the after party. Uh, Aaron, would you like to stick around for that as well? Uh, I would, but unfortunately, I got to I got to get out there. So okay, all right. <laughs> well, Aaron, we'd uh, you. appreciate you coming on tonight. It was it was awesome, it was a great insight, yeah. and maybe we could even have you back again because I think there's more things we could cover. So the hour oh, yeah. goes by fast. So mm-hmm. I would be thrilled. Oh, I would great. Really thrilled. And thank you. Awesome. Thank you so for I didn't scare you away. Good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Nick, too, even though I can't thank you personally right now, but I will yeah. later. Uh, he uh, being generous to come on this show twice, and, and gosh, he's inspiring for his uh, success he's having uh, in the publishing. So um, thank you, Nick, if you can hear us still for coming on. Yeah. <laughs> thank um, you, Nick. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I want to remind everybody, please, 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 please give us a share. Um, you know, link to us wherever you can, thumbs up, iTunes reviews, all those things uh, really, really help uh, to keep the show viable. So uh, if you just take a moment, we greatly, greatly appreciate it. And, uh, again, if you want in the after party, uh, give a shout-out in the comments. Um, 
next week uh, we have I booked the guest and um, see I, I I told myself I wasn't going to do this <laughs> and um, oh, no, Stacy Claflin is on next week correct oh, no 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 you got your weeks mixed up next week is uh, Krista <laughs> Walsh oh okay then the week after Stacey. yeah okay. and and th and then it's Stacy yeah okay. so you, so you're half right yeah there you go it's always <laughs> close uh, like a, I, I'm, I'm, it's baby steps, Xavier. With the well, you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Baby steps. <laughs> so, All well, right. anyway, join us next week. Uh, with Kristen Walsh. Kristen Walsh, yes. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for watching. <laughs> say, say goodbye. Bye, right. everybody. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, Internet. <laughs>